Hello friends, welcome back to Dungeon Design in Zelda. This is an ongoing series, so if you haven't seen the previous episodes yet, feel free to go catch up by clicking the playlist in the card above, but otherwise, let's hop into things. <laughs> Last time, we conquered the Earth Temple and received the Amber Tablet, which will create the last opening through the Cloud Barrier, allowing us to descend into the Lineru Desert. We'll land here at the Lineru Mines, where we'll have some things to do before we can make it to the next dungeon. Most notably, we'll be introduced to the Time Shift Stones, which are one of the game's coolest mechanics. When struck, the Time Shift Stones create an area of effect, and the space within that bubble is transformed transformed back to the state it was in the distant past. It's a really strange localized form of time travel. This, for one thing, gives a wonderful visual flair to this area, contrasting the barren lifeless desert with its former state as a lush, green environment. Ancient ruins show their old colors as lively and ornate buildings, and most interestingly, old machines, mechanisms, and this race of ancient robots spring back to life. Yes, indeed, as it turns out, the Lineru region was once home to the ancient robots, who, along with many of their machines and equipment, harnessed these time shift stones as a power source. There's some really cool puzzle solving involving these time shift stones, wherein we may have to switch back and forth between these two eras just to make it down a single hallway. As automated minecarts become functioning, sink sand becomes solid floor, barriers vanish, and doors become openable. It's incredibly clever design. Eventually, we'll make it to this section of the desert where we'll find these ancient ruins. One of these ancient robots, which we rescue here, upgrades our beetle to allow it to pick up and drop items, which is most useful for grabbing bomb flowers and dropping them onto enemies or hard to reach rocks. Soon after, we'll also have our map altered to reflect the ancient state of this area, showing where hidden paths are. That's pretty neat. At the back end of the desert, we'll find this temple, known as the Temple of Time. No, not that Temple of Time. However, the entrance is blocked off. We'll learn that there's an alternative entrance through the ancient Lanayru mining facility. However, the entrance to that place is also blocked off. We'll uncover said entrance by finding this rotating mechanism, activating three corresponding mechanisms spread throughout the desert, then activating the main one, rotating its dials so that it reflects the directions of the other three as indicated on your map. It's a pretty cool puzzle. Once done, this ancient structure will rise from beneath the sand, revealing the entrance to the dungeon. is the Lanayru Mining Facility. Presumably this was once where the ancient robots would take the time shift stones to be refined. However, it's been lost to time, filled with sand, and overrun by pests, like these Araka creatures which just jump on you after- Get off of me, you creepy crawly creature! This place also features the time shift stones that we saw outside, meaning we can alternate many of the rooms between their current, run-down state, and back to their glory days when the facility was operational, as minecarts, conveyor belts, and whirring machines run autonomously, transporting raw ore and time shift stones between its many rooms. I have to commend Skyward Sword for how it takes what could have easily easily been a lifeless and bland area, being the vast barren desert, and using that as a way to juxtapose itself with its former glory days via these time shift stones. 
The striking visual difference between these two time periods is really pleasant to see. It's a visual treat. The present day has this melancholic, deteriorated feeling, while the ancient past is vibrant, colorful, and bustling with energy, literally in some cases. The difference between these time periods' enemy types aids in this contrast. All of the enemies in the present day are creatures who have moved into the abandoned facility, like Keese, the creepy Arrakas, the Spooms, and the blowfish-like Frokes. Meanwhile, in the ancient ancient past, we have aggressive mechanisms such as these Bemos, Centrobes, and this variant of the classic Armos statue. All of these mechanisms seem to be powered by this ancient blue energy via the time shift stones, and serve to protect this refinery from intruders. Just like outside in the desert, the time shift stones play a vital role in the puzzles and obstacles of this dungeon. You'll find yourself unable to overcome certain obstacles if you're in the wrong time period, and the dungeon adds a twist to this by having smaller areas of effect with some of these stones, and placing some of them in moving minecarts, which cause platforms and enemies to appear and vanish as the stone moves throughout the room. I love this stuff. The architecture here is pretty neat. The industrial factory feeling of this place is done very well, without it being just bland metal sheets littered with nuts and bolts. Despite being a refinery, the mining facility is incredibly detailed and ornate, with depictions of the ancient robots who ran this place being carved into the doors and walls, as well as some statues of them found here and there. There's these colorful patterns and symbols lining every floor and wall, and even paintings on the ceiling depicting clouds and stars. Interestingly, barred doors, which usually feature simple iron bars blocking them in other dungeons, depict instead what appears to be the outlines of sand in an hourglass. Considering the dungeon's time travel mechanics, as well as it being found in the center of the desert, you know, literal sandy place, I simply can't think of a more suitable symbolism to represent this place. Thanks goes out to my pal Lorulian Historian for pointing this detail out to me. The music here is designed to reflect the time travel aspect of the dungeon, as different layers and instruments fade in or out to represent the time period that you're currently in, with this echoey, hollow sounding version representing the deteriorated present day state of the facility. Meanwhile, this robust and energetic version of the song plays in the past when the facility was operating and colorful. In theory, this is great. I really love this idea, but it's held back by the fact that I find the song itself to be incredibly irritating. Something about this repetitive high note on what sounds like maybe a xylophone just annoys me so much. It's the only dungeon music in the series that I can think of that I actively dislike. In fact, I would say that I feel nearly everything about this dungeon is really great, except for that song, which drives me bananas. I'll admit that the past version of the song is far more bearable with that robust instrumentation, but even then that repetitive high note still hammers on. It's really too bad, because it holds back what could otherwise be a nearly flawless dungeon experience. Okay. Progression time. The dungeon will begin us in this foyer room. There's a single door which is locked, and on either end of the door are these levers which we can pull down. This one on the right is accessible by dashing across the sink sand, which opens this alcove with an optional treasure chest. The other lever can be reached by using the beetle to drop a bomb flower into this statue to knock it over, then dashing across the sand here as well. I like how this puzzle is telegraphed to you already. We've had some practice with this idea of knocking the statues down, outside, but even still the dungeon makes sure to place some of these statues already knocked over on either side of the room to reinforce this idea. And the game has done well to hide goodies behind many of these statues to incentivize us to actually investigate behind them. It's good stuff. Okay, into the next room there's a pair of Staldras to kill, remember to cut all three heads in a single strike, and there's three doors from here. One to the east, which requires a key, one to the west, which is barred shut, and one to the north on a ledge. 
That's the only one that's unlocked, so we'll go there first. We can reach the ledge by pushing this block and climbing up. This takes us to the dungeon's massive central room. However, at this time, only a small section of the room is actually accessible, as this section to the north and the west are both gated off. We can access this balcony on the east end of the room by first using the beetle to grab a bomb and dropping it on these crates to destroy them. Climbing up to the balcony, we'll find a chest with our first small key. Great. The ladder to go further up is blocked at the top, so there's nowhere else in this room we can go just yet. Instead, we can backtrack to the previous room and spend that key we just found on the eastern door. This will take us into what I'll call the first factory room. There's several conveyor belts in this room which are currently inactive. We can cross here, climb this ladder, then destroy the crates blocking the next ladder with the same method as before, and at the top of this ledge we'll find this push switch which opens access to the time shift stone in the center of the room. It's a bit tricky to hit if you're using your slingshot, so I recommend just using the beetle to activate it. This brings the factory room to life, activating the conveyor belts and the machines in here. I just love the visual presentation of rooms like this. This one. There's several Beemos which can be defeated by attacking the glowing blue weak points, specifically cutting them down to size by slashing across these midsections and then stabbing the eye. If they do fire a laser at you, then you can shield parry to reflect it back and momentarily stun them. We'll want to make our way over to this end of the room by crossing these conveyor belts. We'll pass by this locked door, remember that, and by making our way up here we'll find this lever which opens the door. There's another lever on the lower edge here as well well, which opens the bars blocking this alcove for an optional chest with cash. Heading into the room we just opened takes us into this room with these blocks. We can hop around the top of these blocks to make our way around the room, and if we knock these frokes back into the piles of rocks, they'll actually blow up. Watch where you're jumping because in the lower sections of this room are several spots with spike traps in the floor. Once we make our way to the opposite end of the room, we'll find this platform with a ladder, which brings us to this chest with the dungeon item already. This is the Gust Bellows. The Gust Bellows, which is the opposite of Minish Cap's Gust Jar, is like a portable high-powered fan. It blows wind. That's, that's the whole thing. The item itself isn't that interesting, but how it's used, that's where things get fun. In this room, we can use it to blow these frokes back from a safer distance. The dungeon actually places these two piles of sand right here beside the chest to give you a hint to try the item out as well. And there are actually these sand piles all over the place, which usually hides at least a rupee or some other goodie though occasionally a baddie. It's a nice way to incentivize you to actually explore and use this item thoroughly. Okay, we can continue over to the other end of the room, and in order to access the door, we'll need to use the gust bellows to clear the sand out of the way. Then we can head on through. And this actually loops us back to the central room once again, at the top of that inaccessible ledge near where we found the small key before. We're dropped back into the same spot as before, nowhere else we can go here in the main room. So we can head back into that crossroad room from before, which still had that one door left to go through. We can clear these sand piles in the corner here to find a push block and a switch, so we can use those to open that western door that was barred shut. Heading through takes us into factory room number two. We can dash to these platforms in the sink sand, and we'll find this sand pile in the corner, which actually hides a time shift stone. We can revert the room back to its past state, and use the gust bellows to turn the rotors and move these platforms along the rails. We'll also use the gust bellows to spin this pinwheel above the door to open it. There's a Beemos here, as well as our first encounter with a Centrobe. They'll launch missiles at you, which can be reflected back with a carefully timed shield parry or by using your sword Dead Man's Volley style. When it launches these mini orbs at you, they can also be destroyed by swiping your sword along the blue lines. This enemy is pretty cool. I just wish that when they died, they didn't consistently drop piles of cash into bottomless pits. At least come over to the ledge, please. Okay, we can cross this gap, grab this optional chest if you want, then climb up the ladder here, dispatch this Beemos, and open this door by spinning the pinwheel beside it. The next room has a pair of Staldra to battle. Assuming you're not encountering a game-breaking glitch, you can push this block over to reach the ledge. Behind these bars is a chest, and you'll also see some piles of sand. You can use the gust bellows, and you'll uncover another time shift stone, just tucked out of reach. You can use either a Skyward Strike or your Slingshot to activate it transforming the room. Now we'll have our first encounter with this game's version of an Armos. You can spin the rotor on its head, just like those platforms we saw before, and strike the two gems in its mouth? Mouths? Mouths? 
This unlocks both the next door as well as the bars blocking that treasure chest. So we can duck back over and open it to get ourselves the dungeon map. It's kind of strange in my opinion how early this dungeon gives you the item and how late it waits to give you the map, since there's now only a handful of unexplored rooms. But oh well, that's really no big deal. This next door takes us back into the main central room in that barred off southwestern section. You can actually open this gate from here to make backtracking easier, but otherwise what we'll want to do is use the map to navigate the submerged pathways under the sink sand here which is one of those concepts that was introduced to us outside of the dungeon. We'll find a crawl space here with a mini labyrinth, leading to this optional chest with some loot, as well as one here, which leads us into the next room. The floor of this room is almost entirely covered in sand, which we'll want to disperse some of since there's hidden spike traps all over the place. As we make our way around, we'll uncover the safe path through this room, as well as a switch to unlock the door, and another optional chest, all hidden beneath the sand. I will admit that clearing out sand in here is weirdly satisfying to do, not unlike some of the vacuuming in Luigi's Mansion 3. Alright, through the next door, we'll find ourselves in the northwest corner of the central room now. There's a sand pile here, which hides a minecart with a timeshift stone. Striking the stone will activate the minecart, and as it travels along, the timeshift area of effect will cause platforms to appear across these gaps so we will have to follow along to progress through the room. We'll come to this platform near the center of the room, where we'll battle a centrobe, and the cart's path will be blocked by this gate. We can open this one with the gust bellows as well, and follow the cart through. Stay close to the cart to cross this section as well. There's a couple bemos, but only one is actually mandatory to defeat. There's not really enough time to defeat the rest, so I just recommend stunning them by reflecting their laser back at them, then moving on. At the end of the tracks, we can open this gate, which is right near the first entrance into this room on the southern end. Cross the bridge to the east, and we'll find a second minecart. We can activate this stone and follow along the path here as well. There's a barred door here along the path, but the cart won't stop here. In order to open the door, you'll need to wait as the minecart passes this pinwheel on the wall and use the gust bellows to spin it before the range of the time shift stone runs out. Also, as a side note, if during these sections you fall off or even and just make it to the end of the cart's path and get impatient, there are these levers placed here so that you can always call the cart back to your position. It's a small detail, but it feels like a nice courtesy. That door we unlocked takes us into the third and final factory room. Watch out for the Araka, and we'll cross the inactive conveyor belt, then climb these vines. We can use bombs to knock over these statues to form a makeshift sort of bridge, and in this corner of the room we'll find a time shift stone under this pile of sand. So let's activate it. Now we can head back across here, dispatch this Beemos, cross the now active conveyor belts, then use this platform to cross the ledge on the other end of the room. We'll fight another centrobe here, and we'll find more of these statues on this end of the room. One is already knocked over as a hint, so we can knock the other two over using bombs, and we'll see that behind each of them are these symbols of robot faces. Keep that in mind. On the other side of the room, there's three more statues to knock over, so we'll use this rotor platform to cross over here move this block to open this ladder for later, then ride the other rotor platform to put ourselves into position to knock over the other three statues, which each hide a gem switch. So there's a simple enough puzzle here. There's the three gem switches, and those three sets of robot faces with the corresponding order to strike the switches. Two, three, then one. Oh, right, 23 is number one. Thanks for reminding me, buddy. So strike them in that order, and that will unlock the gate at the northern end of the room. We can duck down this path and climb up that ladder we unblocked, battle these two Armos, and we'll find this chest with the boss key in the form of this ancient circuit. This door will arbitrarily unlock for some reason, so we can head over there and we'll emerge in the northeastern end of the central room. There's one more optional chest we can find on this ledge here, but otherwise we can activate this final time shift stone in the minecart, ride the rotor platform across the gap here, and bring the cart over so that the boss door is within the time shift area of effect. We can do this rotating puzzle with the ancient circuit to unlock the door and head into the boss room. I 
The boss room is flooded with sand, appearing empty at first, but it won't be long before the boss emerges from below. This giant scorpion creature, the thousand year arachnid, Moldorak. <laughs> Okay, so Moldorak is the adult form of those tiny little Araka creatures we've been killing the entire way through the dungeon. And I guess it's pretty pissed off that we killed all of its babies. Understandable, actually. The visual design of Moldorak is pretty straightforward. It's a giant scorpion. Moldorak has a single eyeball on its face and another eyeball in each claw. Despite the admittedly cliche boss design, I really like how dangerous this guy looks. If it grabs you with one of its claws, you'll be trapped in its grip and it'll drain those hearts rapidly. In order to defeat it, you'll want to wait until it opens its claws, then strike those eyes. Makes sense. You'll get a bit of a visual indicator as well when it's about to strike you, as its eye will flash red. After enough hits to each claw, you'll actually remove them, leaving only its single eye on its face, which you can stab, you know, you can stab him in the eye. Just, just poke him, just poke him right there. There, just, just, just give him a little poke. Moldorak may retreat beneath the sand, but if it does, you can use the gust bellows to blow the sand around and reveal it, causing it to rise back up from the ground and engage with you again. It won't take too many more eyeball stabs from here, and Moldorak will go down. Not too difficult a boss fight, all things considered. It's certainly far from the best the game has to offer. I genuinely think that if they had upped the difficulty here, that this could have been a far greater battle, but unfortunately, we don't get that. So this one goes down with Scaldera as being a sort of underwhelming boss battle. Actually, I would still put it above Scaldera, however, because at least you have to stay engaged in the battle, instead of, you know, just standing around waiting your turn. So despite its lack of difficulty, at least it's still a fun battle. With the boss defeated, the sand will drain from the room, and we'll get our heart container. Before we move on, I just want to say that this boss room is super cool if you just linger here for a moment to look around. There's this cool stained glass skylight, and the bottom of the room appears to be a switching station for some sort of rail system. It's very detailed, but most players will probably just grab the heart container and go. So, I thought I'd mention it. It's just too bad we never get to see this room in its past state. Ah oh well. Heading through the door, we'll find ourselves in this enormous hallway. In order to cross the gap here, you can use the beetle to to activate the time shift stone at the center of the room so that we can ride this minecart along the rail here. This room is just all spectacle. The game just really wants you to look around and appreciate how gorgeous it is, and I love it. It's simply beautiful. Heading up these stairs takes us into this cutscene. We'll be inside the Temple of Time, finally, and we'll see Zelda here with that Sheikah figure from before. But suddenly, our pal Girahim bursts in to ruin the happy reunion. He places a barrier in our path and goes right for Zelda. This character, now revealed to be Impa, blocks Girahim's path. Zelda takes the moment to throw us her harp, but there's no time to admire it. Girahim breaks Impa's shield, but the barrier wears down and we leap in. Impa and Zelda escape through this portal, which is actually the Gate of Time. And Girahim is pretty peeved. He promises us pain whenever we next shall meet before teleporting away, leaving us all alone once more. So that's the dungeon. Oh man, the Lanayru mining facility is such a fun dungeon to complete. I love the way it weaves in and out of this massive central room, constantly allowing us to create shortcuts. And I adore the time shift stone mechanics here. It's such a brilliant twist on the dungeon formula, and such an interesting twist on the time travel concept, giving us these smaller areas of effect. And most of all, I just love the aesthetic of this place when it's in its past state, and how good looking it is is made even more apparent when the game contrasts it with its run-down present-day state. While there are some underwhelming ideas here that hold the dungeon back from being the very best the game has to offer, namely the boss battle, the annoying dungeon music, and the gust bellows being somewhat meh as an item, even those points could be argued. Music is incredibly subjective, so even though I don't care for it, maybe someone else might find it catchy. The gust bellows may not be the best item, but the way it's used is really good. It's genuinely used for some creative and satisfying puzzles, and even though Moldorak isn't the coolest boss battle, it's still manages to be pretty engaging and genuinely has a creepy design. Overall, the good stuff here far outweighs the bad. The dungeon is incredibly creative, has just the right amount of style and spectacle, and above all else, is just genuinely really cool. Thank you so much for watching everybody, I just want to take a quick moment to thank everybody who supported me on Patreon, particularly those who supported at the cheese tier or higher, which includes Tetra, 
Brenda, Justin, Callie, Finley, and Grey Mage. Thank you so much for watching, everybody, and I will catch you next time. Bye-bye!